Howdy, Zach. Howdy, folks. First, you say that the golden rule is everywhere because God wrote it on all men's hearts. I say it's everywhere because it's incredibly obvious, yet it doesn't even apply in every single case. Next, uh, thanks for clarifying on point two, subsection seven, where an infinite cause must be infinite in all ways. I had to smile at you for highlighting the difference between infinitely hot and infinitely cold because I was probing you to see if that's the direction you would go, and you did. You even went further to talk about evil being a lack of good, something I was going to get at, it seems that you and I have heard of the same Christian scripts. Was it a student who stood up to his classroom professor in the version you heard? It's an interesting idea, evil being a lack of good. Because what does that make sin exactly? An incarnation of something that doesn't exist? Now we're getting somewhere. Christ died for something that doesn't exist. <laughs> Next, uh, you asked me to comment on a video by Ravi Zacharias. If you want my full response, grant me an extra video and you'll have it. I like Ravi because he's like a word game factory. The short answer to his video is, his ignorance is appalling and his arrogance is supreme. Back to your point two video, we talk about necessary being some more. Necessary being, something that cannot not exist, pardon the double negative. I agree with your definition, Zach, that surely would be a necessary being, but I can't for the life of me think of such a thing. Your God doesn't seem necessary at all. I even find him unlikely. There could be just a nothing. Theoretically. Really, at this point, the rest of the sub-clauses of point two fall apart. We just need a cause. And if you want to go back to philosophy, be my guest. I'll go with you. There is only one way that nothing can exist, if nothing can exist at all. There are infinite ways that something can exist. And if you look at the ratio of one over infinity, you get a big fat zero representing nothing's chance of existing. We just need one of infinite causes, and any of them will do, but none of them are necessary. Unless, of course, Christian cosmologists know something about non-beings from nowhere who never existed that mainstream scientists don't, that's a Nobel Prize right there. No, the alternatives that I listed will do quite nicely until something better comes along. Better. I am not impressed with Ravi Zacharias, Kent Hovind, William Craig, Ray Comfort, or any religious leader makes up an idea of a necessary being, presents the definition that they themselves made up for it, and then disqualify the alternative first causes because they don't fit the new definition. That's a word game at its best. Your God doesn't even fit the definition in several key points, but I've gone over this list before, maybe I should do so again and hit the new ones that you elaborated on. Potentiality. I can see your God not existing quite easily, so there's potentiality right there. I don't know where you get the premise for this idea, but until recently this kind of thinking had been dismissed even by the religious. It wasn't until William Craig revived it that it came back so strong amongst the faithful. Please tell me you aren't pulling the sophomoric Anselm argument to show God's lack of potentiality. Please tell me you aren't relying on Craig's word game of a maximally possible being. Please tell me that you aren't going to use anything produced by a Hovind. All of those are extremely unimpressive and have already been debunked. I'll combine five and six for brevity. There can be only one undivided necessary existence. But wait a second, we've got a trinity in Christianity. Dang it. Let's see, how does the math go again? Three equals one, one equals three, something like that. Three separate persons, but one unified God. But they're not divided. The question is, are all three parts of God necessary or not? If they are, then which two are you going to explain away so that there can only be one necessary undivided being? Subclause 7. It'd be infinite in all attributes. Thanks for clearing that up again. Uh, well, okay. How about this? If lies are the absence of truth, the same way that evil is the absence of good, then God lacks infinite truth. You can tell by the Bible, which gets things wrong where hyperbole or metaphor are used, or when Jesus is sarcastic. The only thing that you and I agree on with the first cause theory is that it must be uncaused. I don't think we're going to agree on what the first cause must be, or the criteria that you put forward. That's okay, this is a debate. I understand the concept you're trying to get across, I just don't accept it. One last thing before I go, you said a quote that needs addressing. It seems to me that for mind to give rise to matter, it takes a lot less faith than it does for matter to give rise to mind. It's implying that it takes more faith to be an atheist who believes in a biogenesis and evolution, or just anyone that believes in those two, than it does to be a Christian who believes that a magical ghost created everything from its non-material mind. You then challenged me to give an example of matter creating a mind. 
All right, and a shout-out to Tiny Saint, who came up with the same answer I did. A sperm and an egg create a mind just fine without having minds of their own. There are also some great examples of computers programming computers or programs through a process much like evolution to come up with an artificial intelligence, but I don't have time to go into it to back up the claim. But how about the most obvious one? A brain. And I'll back that up in a second. It takes way less faith to go about it my way, and faith is really the wrong word for it. The reason I'm not letting this slide is because it looks like that you think that you can create a being with your mind. You seem to think that you can think God into existence, if you can find the right philosophical word game. Am I right? Isn't that where all this first cause evangelism is going? On your side of things, I don't know why you think the ghost theory is easier to believe. It's a lot less complex. Sure, God did it. But we know that a mind is completely dependent on matter. The mind you are suggesting is something completely foreign. Mind might be a close word to describe it, but all minds we know about are completely dependent on matter. This is reaffirmed time and time again as humanity studies the brain. If I take a fork and smash up someone's brain, they lose their mind. Yet if I blow someone's mind, their brain is fine. Word game? Possibly. How about a fun fact? You can affect the brain by affecting the mind. Christianity has been proven to cause brain damage. Link below. Problem is, splitting the mind from the physical brain is impossible. The mind is just something we experience because of physical programming. So I'll return the question to you, only flipped. When has a mind that is not connected to matter ever worked or existed? One example will do. Follow up, give one example of a mind creating matter. Again, one example. The only thing a mind has created is an idea. Hardly something that exists in the form of matter. Unless, of course, you want to get technical and say that minds create ideas which have a physical representation in the real world as they are encoded into our brain. But going down that road proves that minds don't actually exist independent from physical reality.